I have been working on a raven's tail robe and uh, if you've just joined me, I'm Evelyn Vanderhoop. Kajuth is my Haida name. I'm a Haida weaver and I weave the chief's robes of the Northwest Coast. Thank you for joining me and I will be demonstrating two strand, two color technique that is unique to the raven's tail robe. Uh, it's an enclosure of four warps sometimes two, depending on the pattern. And you um, graph your patterns, they're geometric patterns. It's a very old technique. In fact, for a while there, uh, nobody had memory of um, weaving this ancient technique. And it was uh, through the um, research of Cheryl Samuel, who is a non-native person, but who had been writing a book about the Nahin weaving, the Chilkat dancing blanket. And while she was doing that research, she found out about this ancient weave that um, Lieutenant Emmons had mentioned in his monograph, uh, back, way back when he wrote that monograph, <clears throat> but way back then. And uh, she was reading it and saw that there was an ancient technique that he mentioned, and he even grafted it out. So uh, that piqued her interest and then she traveled all over the world looking for uh, robes that might be in museums of this ancient uh, weave. So then um, she started teaching and my mother was one of the first people that wove uh, this technique with her and brought it back to life. And now uh, we have lots of weavers along the coast. We have people up in Juneau and um, down in Washington State, and I have traveled all over the place teaching that. So um, now in the pandemic, we're not gonna be teaching too often, so, or in person. So with the um, technology of uh, the internet, then I'm trying to continue that um, interest and uh, hopefully uh, people who are weaving along in ho at home um, may, be uh, helped by my demonstrations. And I've also been trying to incorporate history and cultural knowledge into, um, into my demonstrations. So as I demonstrate, I will be telling the story sometimes. So anyway, welcome uh, to uh, this broadcast and uh, I'm hoping you'll all have a good weekend and, and uh, good weaving. How are I'm reading from this book, Clinket Myths and Texts, recorded by John R. Swanton. And this is Story 99, Moldy End. The Kiksadi used to live at Dahait, where they dried salmon. After they had gotten through drying it, they tied it up there. So he, a small boy, was baiting a snare for seagulls. When he came into the house afterward, he was very hungry. Mother, I am hungry, give me some dried salmon. So she gave him a piece of dried salmon, which had begun to mold on the corner. Then she said, you always, then he said, you always give me moldy cornered salmon. He spoke to the dried salmon. Just then someone, out, someone shouted out, there is a seagull in your snare. So he ran down to it. He ran out into the water to his snare, and when he got out into the midst of the water, he looked as if he were pulled down into it. Then all of the drawing salmon ran down to him. Now the people were hunting for him, but he was nowhere to be seen. It was not known what had happened to him. The salmon, however, began feeling like they rushed to the mouth of the creek. It was the salmon people that had done it. Then the salmon people went out to sea with him. They went seaward with him toward their homes. He was among them for one year. Well, out from that town, fish eggs were heaped up. He began to take up and swallow those, swallow some of them without asking anybody. Then the people shouted, Moldy N is eating the town's people dung. At that time, they gave him the name. Afterward, he discovered that the salmon tribe had saved him. Then he went to lie down and remained in that position. In the morning, his father said, What did they say to you, my son? 
he went out and spoke. Take him up to Amusement Creek. Put his hands around the necks of the sandhill cranes at the mouth of it. There he saw two sandhill cranes jumping up and down, facing each other at the mouth of the creek. All creatures, such as brants, could be heard making a noise down in that creek. This is why it was called Amusement Creek. Where was it that he had been feeling badly? It all got out of him. The salmon people all knew the salmon month had come up here, which was their month for returning. They always spawned up here among us. And once they started back with him, they started up this way. Then the coho people broke their canoe. This is why the co cohos come up last. The big salmon people started up. Very soon the salmon tribe came to the sit. It is the sit which gives sears or which gives scars to whichever one happens to get caught in it. After all got through, the people looking could see a cloud far down on the horizon, which appeared like a canoe. In the evening, they went ashore to camp. They dug holes in the ground and made their sticks to sticks to sticks into the ground. The salmon tribe always does that way. Then the salmon people would throw hot rocks upon one another. Their bodies vibrated with the heat. It is that that leaves scars on the skin of the salmon. It was lively frog in pond that let people know what the salmon people do to one another. That's the name of the boy, lively frog in pond. And once they started hitherto up this coast, the salmon people came across the herring tribe. In the canoes of the salmon tribe, one stood up. He said to them, when did your creek flush ever fill a man? The others stood up one by one another. The herring tribe said in reply, we fed them before you. Our eggs are our cheek flesh. When will the space around your backbone not be dirty? The salmon tribe started off for the outside coasts of these islands. And then they got outside of them. The salmon chief said, to what creek are you going? Having held a conference, the salmon people named their choices. The humpback said, we will go to Saliva Creek. But the one among them who had taken the man mentioned Doug Heat. The salmon people called it right to the town. And then they looked like that, the eyes of the salmon people. The salmon called human beings seal children's dog salmon. When they first came into the mouth of the creek, the people sharpened poles for them to fall on when they jumped. And then the boys always said, upon my fathers. At once one jumped upon it, where before they had not killed any. At that they, the people, were very happy. Now they saw his father plainly coming down from far up the creek. They said to him, the boy, stand up. He jumped up. Very fine, said his mother. His mother called him a fine salmon. After that, the salmon swam up the creek. The women who were cutting salmon were always seated by Nahdahi with their backs downstream. The salmon, however, were always rushing about down in the creek. The salmon tribe shouted about those who were cutting. When they were partly through drying the salmon, people said to him, go to your mother. His mother was cutting salmon on the beach. The canoe floated below her on the back current. So he floated there with his head sticking out from under it. Then she called her husband's attention to it. A fine salmon is floating here with its head out. His father took up a hook, for he did not know that it was his son. He swam out from him. He never expected to see his son again. One day had passed, or one year had passed since he had disappeared. And once he swam out in front of his father. When he had hooked it, he pulled it out on a sandy bar. He hid it on the head in order to keep it fresh. And then he threw it to his wife. Cut it up. We will cook it, he said. So he put the salmon down to cut it up in the usual manner. The clink had obtained copper in ancient times. 
A chain of twisted copper was around the young man's neck, for he had gone into the water with it on. After he had tried to cut after she had tried to cut around his neck for a while and found that she could not, she looked at her knife. There were bits of copper on her knife, and then she called out to her husband, Come here, so they began to examine it. It was the copper chain that had that was used to hang around his son's neck. Anciently, the people used to have a fine woven basket called lit. As soon as he knew this, he threw it into such a basket. He spit upon it and blew on eagles down. Then he put the basket enclosing the salmon on the roof of the house. Toward morning, there was a noise inside of it. His, the boy's, spirit began to work inside of it. At daybreak, he went up to look at it and a large man lay where the salmon had been. They took their things out all of all the houses, and when they brought what had been a salmon inside, a man went out and spoke to the many Kitsadi. Let all the people go with their heads down. So it was given out. They brought up salt and devil's club. As soon as they had drunk it down in accordance with his direction, they vomited. The devil's club and sea water were vomited out. Toward evening, the shaman bathed. Below this town is a little pond named Beating Time for Shaman Lake, because he also bathed in that. In the evening, his spirits really came to him, and blood kept running out of his mouth. The seagull for which he had gone out came to be his spirit. Then he showed them all things that were to be done to the salmon down in the creek. Cut them into four pieces, he said, he called the, te, the, the, he called, Adeya, that's the way. After that, his spirit said to him, tie up a raft over there on the edge of noisy waterfall. He was testing his spirits to see how strong they were. This waterfall comes down a long distance. And Kitsadi began to get on the raft, which his spirits named Sea Lion Raft. And once he said go, he began blowing on the raft. One man was not courageous enough to go down into the waterfall. And whom, and when the raft went down, he seized the bow of a tree at the edge of the fall. And then it went under. It was gone for one night. Next morning, the noise of shaman sticks was heard at the mouth of the creek. The raft came up from underneath. And meanwhile, the one that had saved him came among his friends and told them that the Kiksadi were all destroyed. Therefore, the women were all weeping. When the shaman saw them, he spoke. His spirit said that the people were not hurt at all, nor were their clothes ever torn. This is why a Kiksadi is very brave. The man who jumped out, however, was very much ashamed. Then they brought the people up from the place where they had come out. Now the spirits worked in him, and he sang for another land otter, so that the people could see his strength. He went out his clothes man to a point that could be seen below. Take a spear, he said. He went to it. He saw nothing and stayed there that night. And then he came back, and when it was day, he the shaman said, Take me down there, he said. Go around the point below here. He said to his clothes man, he cl his clothes man be brave. And then he spit on the end of the spear. He spoke to get strength. And when he got up after speaking and threw it over the point, he hit the land otter in the tra tail. Now the shaman sent for it and said, take it around here. The land otter lay stiff. The spear was struck into the end of its tail. This is why even now the people call that place point thrown across. He put the shadow of his paddle against an island below this. He was going to cut off the tongue of the land otter upon it, the shadow. This is why they named the island divided by motion of paddle. He fasted eight days on the island when he cut off the land otter tongue. Afterward, he came up and they were going to start home from that place. He lived for more than a hundred years. His spirits were of such strength that he lived so long that he could just turn around in one place. So it sounds like the salmon took this boy who had insulted the salmon when he said to his mother that he had a moldy piece of salmon. 
So the salmon took the boy and he was there with the salmon people for a year and he was discovered again by his parents when he returned to the stream. And um, I like this story because it mentions a, a person who takes care of clothes, the clothes people or the clothes person. So it makes me think that in the past, um, our, our garments, our clothing was not just cared for by ourselves personally, but what the, the garments of, of this special um, powers were taken care of by um, a, a person. So um, that was the first time I'd ever heard of that. So I liked the story, but like I say, it's a clinket story that was collected around the turn of the century, the 19th century, 1901 or in the early 1900s um, by John Swanton up there with the clinket people. So um, thank you very much for listening. And I hope uh, you enjoyed this ancient story. They sometimes can be confusing. Um, and uh, I, being, being that I'm Haida and not Clinket, I really don't know all of what is being said, but how what?